folks. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm joining you from uh, Nelson County, Virginia, just outside of Albemarle County. And this is my school campus uh, where I teach uh, geography, world history, and geospatial technologies at Albemarle High School, literally a stone's throw away from the border of Charlottesville, Virginia. Today, if you'd like to follow along with some of the uh, links that I'm going to be sharing today, if you'd go to this bit.ly, uh, bit.ly forward slash just map it, it is not a perfect alignment to this uh, keynote. I had all the intentions to have it line up perfectly and my children running around upstairs had different ideas. Um, so please, uh, a link in there and, and uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to interact with some of the maps I'm going to share with you today. Um, when I was asked to give this keynote, I thought about, let's see, I wonder everybody in this audience will know what GIS is and I quickly concluded that you might not. So part one will be a crash course on GIS and the power of the geographic inquiry model. Two, we will look at how we can use GIS and geographic inquiry to teach medical geography historically and contempor temporarily. Uh, we'll then discuss how can we use GIS for, or how can you use GIS to support your students and your communities moving forward from this moment and then if there are any questions from the audience. So when I think of GIS um, and I think of the power of geography, I think of the power of maps. Um, the first time we had a conversation uh, on using GIS in the history classroom, Dr. David Bodenhamer from the Polis Center um, made a speech or a presentation. He, he, he started off right away with every event has both a temporal and spatial tag. And then he talked about how we really emphasize the temporal and chronology and history. And he said, so often when teaching history, we usually know when something happened with a high degree of certainty. But we have often less, have less precise knowledge of where it happened. And that's where the power of maps come into understanding the intersections of time, space, and place. Um, the images above on the top of this uh, PowerPoint share with you um, trenches at Dien Bien Phu in Vietnam. I had the benefit to travel with the National Humanities Center to Dien Bien Phu a few years ago. A few years ago. And if I just showed my students the pictures of the trenches, they might go, they look like the trenches from the Western Front, which would make sense because Vietnam was French Indochina at the time and they carried a lot of their military strategies with them there. However, while we were there capturing some photographs and video and some other things, I pulled out my GPS unit and I happened to capture a, a picture because I said, this is too, too cool. I got to get a picture of this. And you know, when I came back to my classroom and I started sharing this experience, the picture didn't raise the questions. The map raised the questions and the curiosity. My students started to ask me, where were you? Why were you there? Why is that point significant? And so, to speak to the significance of this point, it is where French Indochina fell to Vietnam in 1954. And if you study modern US history or world history, you know the ripple effects of this fall. Well, while we were there with the National Humanities Center, um, we went to the same site where if you go there now, they commemorate this place. They commemorate this place as if you were visiting the fall of, of Yorktown or the, the, and Cornwallis's surrender of the American Revolution. We were there to use geospatial technologies to develop mobile apps and, and enhance the ability for people to travel to these places and have a better experience. Just so happens we got there and there was a group of students who were in probably ninth or 10th grade. They're using geospatial technologies and mobile apps to interview visitors about our experiences. All of a sudden you can imagine we are definitely um, outsiders to, to DMB and Fu at the time, and they hover around us, they're asking questions. In the background there, you'll see listening in Dr. Christian Lentz from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, Andy Mink is there listening as well, right there in the middle. And as I'm listening, they call me over and say, can we take a picture of you? And I'm like, okay. And next thing you know, I'm on Snapchat. They have taken a picture of me, they're sending a picture out, and I'm realizing like, this is why this technology matters. This is why it's relevant to our students. So as we go through this conversation, creating tools that really connect with our, with our students. 
there are going to be some phrases to think about today. And I'm going to give some give credit to the folks who shared them with me because you don't you don't you don't teach on an island, right? If you do, you're gonna you're gonna not do so well. You've got friends that help you help you get there. So one thing when we talk about using maps to teach things, um, we use it to improve the signal and reduce the noise. It's courtesy of Paul Rittenhouse, a, a colleague of mine who teaches with me with the James Madison University geospatial semester. They sponsor my dual enrollment class in my high school. Layers make maps. Maps make apps. Keep that one in mind as well. And that one's courtesy of George Ann Rebar, who's my co-geospatial chairperson for the BGA. And whenever she does workshops, she really hammers that home. And it's a great way for you to think about how do these maps work. And then lastly, and it's actually a quote that was shared with me nearly 10 years ago by one of our fellow NCHE board members, culture is the history we inherit. So let's start out with what is GIS? Um, well, it's abbreviation, um, but the G stands for geography or geographic, and that's the map. That's the visual that we often see when we look at, look at, uh, at maps or at, at interactive maps. Information stands for a table of data. Um, it can be an Excel spreadsheet. It can be a Google sheet. If you're familiar with Excel, you're one third of the way to doing GIS. If you can read a map, you're two thirds of the way to doing GIS and the system is how the data and the map interact. So if you can click on your computer buttons, you can now do GIS. So that's, that's the three pieces that make a GIS work. Another powerful element to GIS maps is that we can layer information. And that's that idea of how do we improve the signal and reduce the noise when we look at things. Many maps we use in classrooms and to tell stories are very messy. Uh, the nice thing about GIS maps is that we can separate the map features out into separate layers and choose what we see and what we don't see. And that helps comprehension and, and uh, communication. We see these maps in our everyday lives. They're ubiquitous. Uh, these are my directions that I was supposed to take this past Wednesday and head up to Cleveland. When we wake up in the morning, we often check out what's our weather going to be like, and they're using GIS to share with us that information. I want to let you know the maps I'm showing you so far are professionally made maps, but also students can make these maps. This is a map a student of mine made as we're in the, in the heat of political season primaries and soon we'll have elections for his government class project. He was figuring out creating a campaign project for Elizabeth Warren, and he was using GIS to help make the pitch as to where she should go campaign in Virginia, where would be the swing spots. And he's using a GIS to show the relationship between level of education and the way in which people tend to vote in Virginia. They're used by our communities to help make decisions and, and, and inform us on do, making our governments more efficient. This is a heat map that the city of Raleigh made um, to track in live time where trash are. People fill out an app to say, hey, I'm standing here. Um, I'd like to tell you where the garbage is. And then they take this heat map to make decisions as to where should we uh, do street sweeping today. And as you can see, it makes it more efficient. There are certain areas they won't go to every day. Um, but this is actually the map that gets most students to take my GIS class. There's a, a, a GIS professional, Kurt Goldsberry. He started out working in environmental GIS, and then he started mapping NBA shots. And uh, he has now have been an MBA executive. He's worked for ESPN, but he's using the same technology of this map. But rather than showing trash, he's showing where did LeBron James make or miss that shot and how can we make decisions based on that. So the idea that I'm sharing with you is the technology we're going to talk about to map diseases we're using to map so many other everyday elements in our lives. Um, one of my favorite examples just before we kick into really using GIS is how, how creative students can be with this. Similar technique that we saw with the trash and Kirk Gold's various NBA maps. I had a student who set up a Twitter feed and say, hey, where's our hall monitor? And students started to fill out a Twitter feed to say, I saw him here, I saw him there. So she created a heat map to say, hey, during the day, here's where you can find the hall monitor, here's where you can't find the hall monitor. I want you to notice in the bottom right hand corner though, Kelsey, who just became a GIS professional this past uh, December, she graduated from college, she wanted to make sure that students had a, saw the disclaimer that this does not encourage you skipping school. Um, 
in addition, she initially started with wanting to map out trash and find a way to have a really clean school, so she had to go to the hall monitor assignment. What I'm wanting to show you here is that there are so many different levels of where this technology is. It's being used by meteorologists and government agencies. It's being used by high school kids to figure out where the hall monitor is. So to teach you about the power of GIS, I want to look at this historic event right here, um, the fate of the Titanic. And so for that, if you're at the Bitly site, I'm going to try to go out of the Bitly site myself here. Oops. I'm going to be toggling back and forth from things. Do not judge me by my screen, although I think you already have. All right. So at the Bitly site, you'll see there's a link to a Titanic table. You click on that and you open it up. It's going to bring you to a 47 page list of docu uh, list of all the pa uh, passengers that were on the Titanic. At the heart of GIS is location. And so if we were doing this in a workshop, I would say, hey, why don't you scroll through these 47 pages and share with me any spatial or social patterns you notice on the map. As you work through, you would notice that there are a lot of people in first class and initially there are a lot of people from Montreal and New York. And you'd start to maybe ask me questions about what's the difference in a blue um, row versus a white row. And if you look closely, white rows either have a body number or no body numbers. So that means the people were missing. Blue means they survive. But the thing you've got to realize, this is the table. This is the I in GIS. And so we could take this and we have some locations that we can map. If we have locations, we can map them. We have the where, they, where they're from where they boarded and where they were heading. So the team of Esri uh, working with ArcGIS Online took this list from Wikipedia and said, let's make a map and let's see if we can improve the signal and reduce the noise. And if you look on the Bitly site, you will see the second link is the fate of the Titanic link. This is that data mapped, 47 pages. But I want you to notice as I work with this, how much more interactive and powerful the story is because it is mapped. I can filter the distribution of passengers from first class to second class to third class. I can zoom in on a map. I can even say, I wonder what was going on in Ireland. I can go through that pattern again and go from third class to second class to first class. And we noticed that there was one passenger from Dublin, Ireland, Mr. Edward Colley. When I click on the map and I click on his name, it shows me those locational points I showed you. It also shows you his information that is sitting right here in the table. So that is GIS and the power of GIS. Oops, I'm running into my own technical difficulties here. So what I want to share with you is when we're talking about GIS maps, we're linking maps to tables. Also driving a lot of the maps we make and we look at in our schools. We're following the inquiry process. This is the geographic inquiry process. There's a scientific inquiry process. At the end of the day, it's the inquiry process asking questions, acquiring resources, exploring data, analyzing that information, and then acting on that, whether you make a map, a movie, and so forth. At the heart of this for me in historical geography are the questions of where, why there, and why should we care? If you embark in using GIS in the classroom, you'll need to think about what's your purpose? Are you teaching with GIS, using it to enhance your instruction, improving your uh, presentations, your classwork assignments? Or are you teaching GIS? They, you can strike a balance, but there are two different things. And the image in the bottom right is a student of mine creating an equity map for our housing alliance locally, looking at affordable housing. A nonprofit needed a map. Their GIS professional, who often does it, was too busy, reached out to me, and my student had a service learning opportunity. So now we want to move into GIS and epidemiology and look at what's possibly considered the first true GIS. And so if you'd like to interact with me with this map, 
uh, click on the Power of Data link in the Bitly site. This is a map produced by John Snow, who was a journalist in London during the cholera outbreak of 1854. He was trying to figure out why are so many people getting sick. So the link takes you to this Learn ArcGIS Mapping Cholera Activity. Um, Learn.arcgis.com, we'll share the links with you. At the end is a great site to go to to start to learn to use ArcGIS in the classroom or on your own, become an armchair GIS professional. Click on the link here that opens up the map. You may get a warning that says, hey, can't load the John Snow base map. See, ignore that. Click OK. We're cool. Now, to get to the details of the map, let's see. John Snow, are you working today? Um, let's see. Do technical difficulties. Power of John Snow has left me. I'm going to have to go back and find this again. Give me just a moment to technical troubleshoot. Well, how about this? We'll come back to John. So I don't want to waste our time on this. But the, 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 the um, actually no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I want to make sure that we give that give this at least a try. Let's try this again might have been just that we were all accessing at the same time. Yeah, that was it. Okay, so it's here. Sorry about that. It just turns out I think we were all going there at the same time and just the GIS software couldn't load. So here's a map. And again, we talked about tables and data and layers. And if you click on this little icon just below details, this little blue square, it just says shows you the contents of the map. And I love it when I start to do historical GIS maps because students will ask me questions and one time a student said to me, Mr. Bunin, what does SOHO mean? And I'm like, I don't know. And so of course I always have a fact checker in my room. It's similar to watching, um, um, I'm trying to remember this now, um, pardon the interruption on ESPN. They always have a, part, uh, a fact checker at the end and I have students do that for me because I have a way of exaggerating things. And so I said, you know, I don't know. And she said, well, SOHO stands for living south of Houston Street. So there's a south of Houston Street in New York, and there's a south of Houston Street in London. But I want you to turn on the layer for cholera cases by address. So John Snow was uh, investigating London, and he was trying to figure out who is sick and who's not sick. And I want you to click on each one of these, not any of these red dots. I want you to notice the information he's collecting. Wasn't collecting a lot of information. He was interviewing folks and he was give, writing down their address. He was recording the number of cases. And just so you know, the FID is not something he was collecting. It's what GIS needs to collect to make it a digital feature. It's called feature ID. So at this point, if I showed you this map, I'd say, hey, you know what? Uh, where should we go to figure out where the source is? You may have an idea. You may not, but the nice thing about GIS mapping is that it makes it really efficient. As I shared with you, tables make maps. If I hover over the cholera cases by address and click on the show table, it shows the table of all the information he was collecting. And then if we were talking through this in a workshop, I'd ask you, have you seen any strategies that we saw in the Titanic map that we can employ here? that would make the visual and the story better. And if you noticed on the Titanic map, there were larger circles for cities with more people that uh, traveled on the Titanic. So New York City was large and Paris was large. So with information, we can change the signal and we can re reduce the noise. So I'm gonna hover over my layer. I'm gonna say, I wanna change the style. And I wanna change the style based on the number of cases. I'm gonna wait a second and now I'm gonna say, hey, do you notice what's going on here? And at this point, you see a map that shows you the number of cases and it tells us a different story. 
we might say, you know what, I want to go right to that big circle in the middle and see what these people have been up to and what's going on. The other nice thing, though, is I could say, you know what, I want to not just look at values by number in the location. I want a heat map. I want to see the hotspots. So I want you to notice, I literally just went from the style change from graduated symbols to show me a heat map. And at this point, we can say, all right, so now we got to go check out that hotspot. And you know what? John Snow went to that hotspot and he noticed something right there. He saw that right in the middle of that area where a lot of people were sick were public wells. He told the city, take the well, um, take the pipe off the top. Let's close this well down and let's see if people get better. And the story ended well. People started to get better. And so today, if you travel to London, you get to go see Jon Snow's pump. They've put it out there as a commemoration for him finding out that cholera was a waterborne illness. So I use this in both my world history class and my AP human geography class when I start my school year out. And I just want them to start thinking geographically and thinking about that geographic inquiry process. And honestly, just trying to show them that history and geography is cool because some of them don't know that. And then when they start to see that, wow, could I do this now? And you're like, sure, take my GIS class or sure, stick around with me in a few months, we'll be doing it in here. So where are we with cholera today? And we look at G, uh, GIS. This is a recent research study that was done a couple of years ago where NASA is using remote sensed imagery to predict where they're gonna see cholera risk. And this is a, you can go to NASA's website and see it. They worked with West Virginia University on this, but they're now using satellite imagery to predict where they can predict a cholera attack outbreak. And this was in the, in the country of Yemen. So now we move on to another epidemic, um, another virus that, that shows up in our history textbooks. Um, smallpox. Um, I'll ask the question, it might show up in the chat box, but who was the person who developed the smallpox vaccine? By now, I gotta believe we've got at least one Edward Jenner in the room. And since it's a history presentation, I thought we'd use some primary sources too. So here is a, the cowpox cartoon because they were using the cowpox virus to vaccinate people. And it's the, one of the, it's the first vaccine. And notice the cartoon is saying, my gosh, people are gonna become pigs or cows because they're using, not pigs, but cows. They're gonna become cows because we're inoculating them with the cow virus. So where does smallpox show up in the teaching of US and world history? And for that, I want you to go to Back to the bit.ly site, and there's all that stuff. And I want you to click on the gallery for geo-inquiries. So over here, you'll see the geo-inquiry landing page. Geo-inquiries are 15-minute mapping activities that were uh, designed by the Esri GIS software company, and they have collections for a lot of different categories. I think it's up to 15 subjects. When you click on any of these, so if you click on United States, U.S. history, you will see there are level one and level two geo inquiries. These activities were written by classroom teachers. The maps themselves were uh, designed by maps.com. You can scroll down and you can look for the one, I think it's number 15, the Great Exchange. And when you click on the Great Exchange, it will bring you to this map. And so the way the geo inquiries are set up is they are two, page, two pages, PDF, follows the geographic inquiry model. You are given a teacher script uh, to follow if you'd like with buttonology of how to navigate the map. And this one looks at the, the exchange of goods during the age of European exploration. To access the map, you click on the URL in the middle of the page. And that's gonna bring you to this map. Similar to the last map, you can click on the contents tab and it shows you a lot of different layers. The first part of this activity asks the students, where's the potato from? And I'm gonna tell you that the top two answers start with the letter I and the correct answer starts with I. Usually they get it wrong the first two times. They will say Ireland, 
or Idaho. But then in this layer here, notice I can turn on the crop origins. I can turn on the legend. Again, I just clicked on, turned on crop origins, clicked on the legend, and I can say, where's the hearth of these three common ingredients we use today? And the potato is from the Incan Empire. Um, corn is from Central Mexico and bananas are from Southeast Asia. So then we start to have the students start to think about the movement of ideas, the movement of things. And we say, go ahead and turn on present day potato production. And right there, we show cultural diffusion. And you ask them questions about what do you notice and which direction did they travel? What does this tell us about agriculture? This lesson, I'm skipping through a number of steps, is leading to students taking a moment to explore the great exchange the goods and items exchanged between the old world and the new world. Students start out and they fill out a worksheet and they look at all the new world plants. Then they look at the old world plants. Then they look at the new world animals, the old world animals. And I want you to notice this old world animal, horses. So we're gonna come back to that in a moment when we talk about smallpox. And then we go over to the Americas and we learn that they had syphilis. Then we look at the old world. They had smallpox, measles, chickenpox, malaria, yellow fever together, influenza, the common cold. When I ask the students at the end of all this, I could go through the answer key, but often what my number one question is, did you learn something new and did something surprise you? This list right here is the number one surprise that students have. They're like, I knew Europeans brought diseases to the new world. I didn't know how many. And then question number two is, isn't syphilis a sexually transmitted disease? And my question, answer to them is yes, yes it is. And we leave it at that. They've got their phones, they can go Google it. But the idea here is to show you that this is a simple GIS map we can use in the classroom that is showing the mapping and the movement of disease. This map, it's, it's six map notes. Plants, animals, diseases. But students spatially see it. It's no longer just in the text. Europeans brought diseases over there. This gives them a list. So with that, I want to go back to the PowerPoint and give some credit to Dr. West, who was going to speak last evening about the role of transportation on the Central Plains when it came to smallpox. Back to my PowerPoint. So where does that play into our history? Um, it plays into it with the, the ripple effects of European exploration. Um, Dr. Dr. Elliot West is a, is a uh, hist um, historian of the American West. And a few years ago, I had a wonderful opportunity to hear him speak about the grass revolution. And he talked about the role of the horses in trans and transforming culture on the Great Plains. He talked about how the Spanish explorers caused a revolution because they brought horses home. Horses are native to North America, but they had become extinct. The Spanish brought them back. Uh, to fast track this story, in 1680, the Pueblo Revolt released the horses out of Spanish control. The horse influenced food, trade, military travel. When it came to providing power, it, 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 it revolutionized power. It gave uh, natives uh, 10 times the amount of power they had before. But then here's the other thing it did. It sped up transportation. Diseases, and when smallpox did break out prior to the horse, they often would, it would stay endemic and in one area and fizzle out. With horse transportation now, the disease did not have a chance to die out. It was transferred from one location to another. So when we think about how we can bring in medical geography, it's right here. It's already in our curriculum. We don't need to squeeze it in. And that brings us to today. It brings us to this, uh, one of the most popular uh, dashboards with coronavirus. Um, this is a GIS map, but remember that saying, layers make maps, maps make apps. So what you're seeing here is a dashboard that is far more than just a map. It's a map, but then there are also widgets connected to that data where they are keeping up with, keeping up with rates by location, um, rates by recovery, rates by, 
mortality, uh, rates by specific location, then they're also showing the curve, right? And we're trying to, to, to flatten that curve. So this is a GIS dashboard. At the end of the workshop, I'll share with you a link that if you'd like to learn how to make your own coronavirus um, dashboard, you can have one made in an hour. Um, as I said, tables of data, the GIS, this is the information that Johns Hopkins was collecting. Uh, this was collected, this is one a student of mine was making one in class, and so I just took his data set, but he had collected the data on February 14th, um, which that was kind of just a weird day. It's Valentine's Day and he's mapping the virus. It was, it was just kind of weird, um, but it was still a good map. And so anyway, just to show you this table, is feeding this map that's feeding this, um, these infographics. So when I think about coronavirus and I think of it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step away from GIS for a little while and think of how does understanding coronavirus fit into our teaching of curriculum when we look at past events? And that goes back to um, Luis's quote, culture is the history we inherit. Because so many things coming up in the news say, so I'm like, wait a minute, We've seen this before. The first one was the idea of etymology, the importance of naming the coronavirus and the virus that caused it. Um, we've seen headlines about the naming of coronavirus. Recent headlines from the BBC, coronavirus, Trump grilled on use of quote unquote Chinese virus. Uh, Senator or Congressman McCarthy from California knocking the Democrats after they claim saying the Chinese coronavirus is racist. And then this is just a couple of days, it might have been yesterday, I, I took it down today out of the Mercury News in San Jose, coronavirus attacks against Asian Americans reported in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I started to think back to my own medical geography class and my own teachings in my uh, AP human geography class and my own history classes. And I was thinking, we've seen this before. Here's another primary source, 1981 from the CDC reporting on five young men, all active homosexuals, um, have a mysterious virus. We know it as HIV. It didn't start out being called HIV. Here's a timeline of some events taken from HIV.gov. The New York Times published an article. They called it a, a rare cancer and homosexuals and it started to be called gay cancer. August 11th, 1981, Dr. Friedman Kine, a, a local uh, doctor in New York, was looking for some money to do some research. The government wasn't funding it. The government was slow to respond. He raised $6,635 in private donations, which was the only new money, public or private, that would be raised in the first year that this virus started to show up. 1982, May, New York Times publishes the first mention of the term GRID gay-related immunodeficiency disease, which researchers were using in their reports on the new epidemic. It increased the public perception that AIDS affected only gay men. September 28, 1982, Representative Philip Burton and Representative Ted Weiss joined together to introduce the first legislation. It does not get out of committee. So we see parallels here. We see parallels, even though it's coronavirus or COVID-19 is a faster moving virus, these themes are there. What we name it matters. People get stigmatized. Um, we were, we, we've seen in the news that we should have been developing a test earlier. And then it becomes mainstream. And with HIV, it became mainstream when heterosexuals got it. Popular people got it. Think about what triggered the shutdown of all sports. Rudy Gobert tested positive NBA player, the NBA season's over. I want you to know the CDC and the government was throwing money at HIV when regular everyday people within our society at the time in the 1980s started to get it. Then, the media campaign starts up. And I remember in the 1980s, growing up, I'm a good 1980s kid. If I could, I'd go out and get my, uh, my very bright pink and orange and green shirts and things, and maybe even get out some jam shorts. Uh, but I remember seeing these advertisements in Sports Illustrated and other magazines trying to teach people about misinformation out there about who can get AIDS and who can't get AIDS. 
we're witnessing that today on the internet. Some websites saying, hey, this is misinformation. This isn't true. This is. We're seeing HIV today help understand where HIV is and here's, here's a GIS map. So I'm sorry, we're, we're seeing where GIS is helping us better understand HIV today. So that's my historical moment. Now let's come back to how GIS is helping us understand this. One really powerful thing about GIS is scalability. Because when you generalize things um, in larger areas, you tend to stereotype certain areas. This is, a, this is a map that shows you where 50% of HIV diagnoses occurred in 2016, 2017. This is a very different map than this map when I show it to you aggregated by state. So that's the nice thing about a GIS map and helping us get to answers. We change the scale. You can go to a live web map if you'd like at aidsview.org. It's a live map down to the county level providing education to people about how to get help, who's at risk, and so on. They have infographics there um, helping to inform different regions and letting you know that of the 48 highest burden counties targeted with HIV, it's 48% are located in the South. Again, they made that map using GIS. And then when we think of Sub-Saharan Africa, we think of that as the global hotspot for HIV. Um, but the truth is there too, that's an area that to clump an entire geographic area, that doesn't tell the whole story. This is a story from NPR just a little under a year ago where they're using high level GIS to uh, aggregate points down to a heat map to find out where are the hot incident spots in, in Africa. Um, as the uh, quotes say from the article, there's an increasing appreciation this epidemic is even less homogenous than people have imagined. The story is changing. You can see how the number of people who are in need of treatment and where those people are concentrated and it's shifting over time. Folks, that's our story, right? We talk about how the only thing constant is change. We talk about how do things change over time. GIS is helping us better grasp those things. It's an interesting, I don't want to go too GIS-y on you, but I will, because <laughs> I just still love GIS. They're using GPS locations. Think of our phones, right? We have GPS locations. We can say, hey, we're, we can track our friends and see where they are. We can watch the pizza delivery come up to our house. They're using these, these GPS coordinates to tag addresses that they don't have addresses for. They are collecting reports from certain health centers and geotagging those and mapping the data. Um, there's a fascinating story on the Dust Bowl where they mapped out the growth of Dust Bowls by mapping newspaper stories. So really, it's not just information. You can map stuff as long as you know where it happens. Another recent headline. Study, 17.9% of people with COVID-19 had no symptoms. And I thought again to myself, hmm, I've seen that before. It made me think of this woman. I'm going to assume, if I was to ask, who is this woman? By now, I hope there's a comment in the chat box that this is the infamous Typhoid Mary. So, Typhoid Mary story. You know what? She was, a, she was an Irish immigrant to New York. She was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. Typhoid is a waterborne and foodborne illness. She worked for affluent families. From 1900 to 1907, she worked as a cook for seven different families. And one family, after 10 of the 11 of their family members were hospitalized with typhoid, hired a researcher and said, you need to find out where this is coming from. And he pinpointed down that Mary Mallon was the person carrying this virus. They believe that it was spread because on, she worked at a restaurant where they served ice cream and cake on one day a week. And they felt like it was, that was the day that people got mostly sick because she wasn't cooking the food. Um, there was a large investigate, a large trial about it. It lasted a number of years. She went into quarantine temporarily, then she was released, and then they, she, they, they found her guilty a second time, and she's ended up spending the last 23 years of her life in quarantine. And at that point, that triggered me to another connection to today, quarantine. Oh, first, sorry, let me go back to uh, how we're seeing 
GIS being used today with typhoid. And then I'll talk about quarantine. So, and what some people are calling the 21st century equivalent of Jon Snow, scientists are using Google Earth to map out cholera outbreaks in Nepal. And they are sequencing gene sequencing and global positioning systems to localize where typhoid is spreading from its source. So that brings me now to my connection to today. Quarantine, the Venetian word meaning 40 days. And you look on the news and you Google all sorts of things about quarantine. Some are good, some are bad. I went with a nice safe one from the New Yorker, stealth kids movies for the era of quarantine. A little story about quarantine. Uh, you look at this one and you bring it into the history books. We talk about the bubonic plague and that's where the word quarantine comes from. Initially in 1377, uh, the city state of Ragusa in Croatia said new newcomers had to wait for 30 days out uh, on an island outside of the city before they could come in. 1448, they shifted it to 40 days, which lay gave birth to the term quarantine. The bubonic plague had a 37 day period from incubation to death. And so that's where the quarantine became such a successful um, time period. This is a picture of a boat, a quarantine boat right off the coast of uh, Sheerness or Stangate Creek in uh, the United Kingdom. And when we think of quarantine boats today, we've seen that in our history, in our local current events with the cruise ships. We've sent a medical boat up to New York, a naval medical boat to help care for people. So these are other ways we can bring in medical geography in a seamless, natural way. Another recent headline, then and now, how Ithaca responded to the Spanish influenza of epidemic of 1918. Um, I talk about the influenza out outbreak when talking about World War I. Here's a Library of Congress, a shout out to the Library of Congress, a tremendous supporter for this year's conference. Um, here's a primary source from them saying, hey, here are the things you can do to prevent the spread of the 1918 influenza. Looks very familiar as to what we're asking people to do at a national and international level now. So in my classroom, when I get here, I bring up an already made GIS map. It's a GIF and it just shows the contagious diffusion of the virus of, uh, of the flu of 1918. It's a way to teach contagious diffusion. It's a way to show why was it such a, I brought it up right when this, right when we learned, started to learn about this virus, I brought it up to show my students Thank so you. they could get a sense of diffusion. Start Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Terminal. If you know your party's four digit extension, you may enter it at any time. Four. Now I want to shift from past events to start to think about today, because when we finish our, our units in history, we finish with the modern and we often talk about the developed and developing world. We show students maps of where's the developed region of the world, where's the undeveloped region of the world. Depending on the scale, you can create a lot of generalizations. Um, there's a great website out there at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation um, produced by the University of Washington where they've mapped a lot of present day dynamics in the United States. And I'm gonna take a moment to show you that map. So this is a live map that can show you all sorts of different data in real time. So we can show what we wanna show risk factors. And I can go in here and I can show smoking daily. And this shows a map of where people smoke. But I want to show you what happens when I bring this time slider back to 1996 and push play. I want you to just think about what's going on in our own society when we think of social history and, the, and what smoking was like in the United States in 1996 till today. And I want, to show, want you to see how the map changes. The red areas show you where more 
people are smoking daily and the blue areas where they're smoking less. There are a lot of historical stories behind this map. In addition, we can ch change our map to life expectancy. And when I go with life expectancy, we see areas where life expectancy ranges. So if I go down here to Southwestern Virginia, life expectancy in Buchanan County is 73 years. I go up to Northern Virginia right outside of DC, one of the most affluent areas in our country, life expectancy is 84 years. That's development. That raises a lot of questions for my students, being in Virginia. What's going on in DC where life expectancy is 11 years more than just a five hour drive away? Then they'll often say, well, Mr. Bunin, what's going on in the Dakotas? And I take that and, I, and we connect that to Native American reservations and other things that are contributing to life expectancy. So to me, what I like about GIS, it dispels myths. It allows us to get to the heart of learning and say, you know what, not everything you read is true. And that when you shift the lens, you shift the perspective, you get different answers. So that brings me to one other way that we can use met, um, GIS and it's access to medical care. And I wanted to give a shout out to one of my students, Heather. Heather's been doing a number of service learning projects this year uh, for me. She's a GIS two student. And it just so happens I was on an airplane a few months ago and I was sat down and talked to a woman from the University of Virginia who works in their women's center. And we uh, talked to her about uh, how I work with GIS and she'd worked at the EPA. And she's like, oh, I know a little bit about GIS. And I shared with her what my students are doing. She said, you know, I have a project. I work in the women's center and we have a number of patients who need care off campus, but for a variety of reasons, they don't wanna leave campus. I would love to have some maps that reduces the friction of distance for them. I would like a map that lets them know how close care is and how close transportation is. So they shared with Heather a bunch of tables. She's been making a map for them where she is showing, is gonna be able to show UVA students and patients, here's where your care is, here's the bus you need to get on, here's how you will get there, and here's how you'll get back. She's gonna provide for ease of opportunity paper maps, as well as an app that a person fills out a survey and it will return back to them where they can go for care. So I want you to think about, as we go through this, the complete versatility I have shown you with GIS. I've shown you a historical diffusion map, which is like, oh, that's cool down to it's mattering at a personal level for people. And that brings us back to this dashboard. Um, the dashboard is being supported by Esri, uh, ArcGIS Online, which is what a lot of the software I've shared with you. Google Earth is another form of GIS you can use. Um, I really like the ArcGIS Online platform. Um, in the Bitly site, you'll see links at the very bottom for how you can get a free site license for your school, free of charge, having your students make data rich maps from the ground up. Um, but the hope with this data dashboard is that the information is gonna help public health officials and emergency authorities make decisions, whether they should shut down events, whether their reactions to the pandemic are working. Um, and that's, that's the power of GIS. So we're now gonna transition from that's GIS and medical geography now, how can GIS help you moving forward? Because you're gonna leave here in a few moments from this awesome online conference and you're back to the reality we live in now. So think about in your work, when does location matter? How about distance, direction, neighborhood, region, territory, or with my kids, I'll say turf, scale, working from the local, the regional, national, global scale. If you teach and you have any of these themes, then you need to consider giving GIS a try. Particularly as many of us are gonna be teaching online, I'm gonna share with you right now a number of resources ready to go in which you can have your students doing GIS at home and it might not be as powerful as you up in front of the class, but it will be pretty powerful given that you're so far away from them. So to show you one option, we're gonna be eating every day. I have an activity I use in class called Map That Recipe. Tuesdays are Taco Tuesdays in my house. 
this is probably the cleanest that counter's ever been, but we won't tell my, my wonderful wife, Elizabeth, anything about that, all right? So this recipe, this, act, this, this idea of the great exchange in agriculture, every day we cook, we are living a history lesson. So how can you use GIS to do that? Well, first, take your kids out, do the great exchange activity. Show them how food's diffused. Then say, hey, where is the hearth of the food we're eating today? Pull up a recipe. Let each ingredient of that recipe be a row in your data table. Use the directions uh, as you do the geographic inquiry. Show them that, hey, here's how much corn we grow and watch them go, wow, I had no idea we grew that much corn in the United States. But then don't tell them that most of it's not eaten. Then take the directions that uh, I'm gonna share with you. We'll make sure you have it at the end of this and create a geo form. It's a form students fill out in which they map out every ingredient, tell you this is the ingredient, this is the dish I'm making, and I wanna put it on the map. Have them put it on a map. These are ingredients my students put on the map uh, just a few weeks ago, learning about agriculture and AP Human. Uh, in the first semester, we'd use this with my world history class, teaching about age of exploration. I then said, oh, you know what? I just realized something. There's a different pattern for ingredients than there are for recipes. Because see, the recipes come from many of the areas that were colonizing the areas where the ingredients were coming from. That's why there's such a glow in Italy and France for a lot of these recipes. Or it might have just been colonizing. It was also the role of the Silk Road. So I don't want to just put pigeonhole in one area, but a lot of recipes we enjoy today, they come from Western Europe and some from the United States. Then you could say, hey, like this student, my student, Elias, he's a student who uh, his home is his original, he's a native of Tanzania. We, we researched his favorite recipe, maharage. And then there's a great tool in ArcGIS called Connect Origins to Destinations. Think airline map. Say, hey, Elias, what do you think? What's going on here? And Elias is like, I had no idea. My native national dish, maharage, is so global. And I'm like, all right, now you're learning. And you got more out of this than you did out of reading about it in a textbook. And then you can say, hey, let's shift that to a story map. Go out and find some more interesting things. And this is one on a student who did hamburger pie and found that the word casserole comes from the French word uh, for saucepan. I'm like, all right, some more etymology. I like that. And then shift it into a story map. Have them tell you the story of their favorite recipe or a favorite recipe and connect it to the age of exploration, cultural diffusion, and so forth. And then just, just for fun, go John Snow on them and make a heat map. And then you could say, guess what? I didn't have to give you research from old archeology span studies. Your ingredient showed me the agricultural hearths of world history, Central America, Fertile Crescent, India, Southeast Asia, right there on the map. But if you said, wow, that's really cool. Uh, I don't have time for that. I'm just, I just, I really want something quick and easy. Give the geo inquiries a go. They are right there, they're ready for you. The script is written. And the reason why the script is so short is that when we were writing them, we realized teachers don't follow scripts. Um, I will also make sure that you have in the resources at the, at the bottom of this keynote, links to worksheets for your students so they don't see the answer key. Look at the geo inquiry, see which ones support your research. My wife is starting a book club on the Watsons go to Birmingham uh, for local uh, students in the area or uh, um, sorry, uh, neighbors and so forth. They're gonna use the Watson's Go to Birmingham geo inquiry to help geographically contextualize things for my second and fourth grade uh, ch children. Check out the story maps, story map gallery, and have your students sit with them. Look at them and don't give them much to say, hey, what did you find surprising? What did you find interesting? Did you find anything troubling? And then if you're having to cover curriculum and you still, have to you still wanna review World War I, Check out this project on digitizing the Muse Argonne. This is a project that was mentioned that I've worked on in the past. Remember that saying, reduce, improve the signal, reduce the noise. This is the government commission map of the Muse Argonne offensive. It's a mess. The battle was a mess. We took those features on the map and digitized it out into an interactive online map. Again, the bottom left is the table. The top is the map. We actually then went with a group of teachers over there and we collected digital artifact, uh, digital media artifacts from the Western Front so you can bring the Western Front home to your students. 
take your students on a virtual field trip, uh, honoring service and achievements and sacrifice during World War I. Many students find it hard to believe that there are four, over 14,000 American soldiers buried in Western, along the Western Front at the Meuse-Argonne Cemetery. This takes the students on a field trip in which they learn about where, why there, and why does the US government care about this spot? And they learn about a number of different things. They see 3D videos of trenches and so forth. It's all in a very interactive GIS map. And so the website is called uh, Teaching and Mapping the Geography of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. There are essays, there are lessons, and it walks you through it. So if you are looking for a way to jazz up World War I for your students, either as a review or a new activity, go check this site out. And then we also have a Virginia Geographic Alliance and Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources Partnership in which we developed a series of story maps called Placing Primary Sources. Uh, they, were, they were actually presented in a poster today, but I wanna let you know these are story maps designed by teachers of US and world history on benchmark topics that you have either taught or will teach. They are very dynamic, they're ready to go. You get editable lesson plans with answer keys, historical contextual essay, no experience, no problem, not much energy, not much time, no problem. The activities available to you. One, mapping, placing America's journey westward. Looking at the impact of the evolution of political parties in America. Looking at the causes or the leading up to the Civil War and looking at the stepping stones to war. Placing U.S. immigration. Placing U.S. global expansion. Over there, the story of the American Expeditionary Forces. This map does use one of the maps from the Mapping Meuse-Argonne Offensive, but it really looks at the mobilization of forces of the, in America leading up to World War I. So it's more than just the activity I showed you previously. Placing the progressives there, looking at how did that look differently when you shift locations, shift lenses. Looking at World War II in the Pacific, island hopping. And this one shows an interactive graph that shows you what would happen to the casualty rates as people, as the US forces got closer to um, Japan. Placing US involvement in World War II allied victory in Europe. And placing Cold War conflicts. When I get to this point, typically in my unit, once it was created, it was created by a, a wonderful teacher, um, Elizabeth Mulcahy at Western Albemarle High School in which she really wanted a one-stop shop unit for her students to learn all about the geographic complexities of the Cold War. This is the story map for you. Placing civil rights in time and place and looking at um, the evolution of segregation in the United States and then the, the fight to end that. So this places civil rights in time and place around the United States. And then let's say you're like, hey, I like all this, but I really was curious about that coronavirus uh, dashboard or COVID-19 uh, dashboard. Um, go check out learn.arcgis.com and learn how you can create your own monitoring COVID-19 dashboard. It's a one hour activity. And then if you look at this bit.ly up here or this shortened web address, this is a survey that Esri has created to, if you think about it, we're mapping out our responses to where coronavirus and COVID is occurring around the world. This is a survey to allow teachers and educators to map out how are we responding? How are we teaching and so forth? And they have a data dashboard that is tracking our responses. So please go in here and let's, 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 let's share other stories about this, not just the virus, but how we as a society and as a people are responding to it. Thank you. Chris, this is so exciting. I wanna go click on everything at once, uh, but I have to finish leading this presentation, so I can't click them all right now. But uh, if you're willing to take questions, we already have two in the, in the question box, if folks wanna keep them coming in the question and answer box. Uh, we've got so much chats in the chat box, I'm afraid I'll miss them, it's great. People are excited. But go ahead and put them in the question and answer box. 
Um, I think uh, Joseph Perino had asked about the story map tool and it looks like you, you referenced that. But Rich wanted to know, to know, he says, talk about bias in map data, e.g. zones where people do not have phones or public health clinics. You know, that's a great question. And I can bring up some other maps for you because I'm glad you did. I think, I, again, don't judge me about my desktop. I meant to clean this up today. Uh, but actually, I'll show you a map we just made yesterday. Um, so I got a, a, a te an email from someone in our school division who said, you know, we're going to be having to put hotspots out there for, um, for web, web connection and internet. And they said, do you think we could make a map to let people know where to go? And I said, I'm sure we couldn't. I actually reached out to my rock star, Heather, and I said, hey, Heather, the division, you don't have to do it. It's not required. But they are wanting a, a story map about hotspots in Albemarle County. So we created a quick web map to say, hey, if you need to get internet access, Here's a map. In addition, Heather is actually working with our broadband authority. They've created an app to find out locations in our division where kids don't have really good internet connection. And our school division is investing in mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, but they carry, they work on 5G and they work with different carriers. And so she's working with them to create maps that school or an app so that when school librarians can or the school librarians can use so when a student comes up and says hey i need a khajiit that's what the name of the unit is i said that at my department meeting a couple of days and they're going like what are you talking about i don't know what a khajiit is it's just a mobile uh, hotspot um, so anyway to try to make this long story shorter she's working on creating an app with the data that we get so that when a student shows up to a librarian and says i need a mobile hotspot She'll type in their address and she'll know which hotspot to give them to take home to work. We're still creating the, the, the data collection for that. Um, as for equity mapping, there is a teacher in Colorado who created a survey and surveyed her last four years of students to fill out a survey of their internet connection. And from those locations, she created hotspots of where there's a lack of internet connection. And my understanding is the school division is now driving buses around with mobile hotspots on them to provide internet access to students. For our division, we wanted to make sure students, people knew where they could go for a, a mobile hotspot. So we've made our high schools and all of our schools, parking lots, mobile hotspots, as well as the regional libraries. So when people click on it right now, they'll get the name of the area. They'll get the name of the area. Well, it should show up. Let's see, yeah, it will. Um, and then when you click on it, you'll see there's a link to it right here under, oh, it's under this one, I think. That's right, under here, if I click on more info, it'll take you out to that library's website. So sorry to clunk around a little bit, but yeah, so I mean, I think, I think you're right. You have to be aware of the data um, and that's why, and that's good historiography too, good source work. And that's, I think, one of the valuable things to teach students is doing good, source work of your, your data mapping. Uh, what I think is nice about GIS is democratize maps so that we're no longer stuck with what we see is what we get. So I I know I've had people challenge some of my maps and that's great because I can say, you know what, why don't we make your map and we'll compare them. And we can have two different um, contextualizations of the same event, which is, is great. I mean, that's the beauty of GIS, it democratizes it. So we, we put more control in the hands of our students and our communities. All right, I think we, okay, yeah. Allison says statistics people have ways of acknowledging and trying to compensate for undercounted and underreported data inconsistencies. Excellent. All right. Well, Chris, we would like to thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it has been youth useful both in light of the remarkable time we're in, but also just, just in general, in terms of giving history educators so many more tools to work with. It's, it, I, for me as an educator, it's always just, such, it's so refreshing 
to get new things that I'm excited to work with. So on behalf of everybody here, we just want to thank you so much. Um, and, and everybody, uh, Chris volunteered to do this a week ago. So that's amazing that <laughs> he put this together. He realized there was a need that we needed to get this out there and we were just delighted that he was able to put that together. So, yep, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, that's great. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out. I know you've heard, heard earlier, but uh, thank you to you and the NCHC staff for pulling together an online conference in five days. Um, and thank you for having me. We are delighted to have you. And thank you for everything else you did for the conference too. Um, Again, just thank you, board, staff, presenters, sponsors, exhibitors, everybody. We really appreciate it. We hope that you take some of these ideas of National Humanity Center, of course. We hope that you take a lot of these ideas to your online classrooms now. Um, we wish you all the very best. 